Uh, the next uh, uh, part of the program is going to get into a, a program that uh, really was around uh, many years ago and was uh, the United States' first space station. And uh, we landed on the moon uh, six times, and when we were coming back from that uh, sixth landing, uh, there was a crew in training getting ready to launch and fly uh, on the, uh, the Skylab, which was uh, our first space station. And uh, that that's Skylab uh, launched in May of 1973. Uh, the launch didn't go quite as, as planned, but you'll hear more about that. Uh, the moderator for our session this, uh, this morning is uh, one of the crewmen that flew on that first mission on Skylab, Joe Kerwin. Uh, he became a Navy flight surgeon in 1958 and got his uh, Navy wings in 1962 and became an astronaut in 1965 and then flew on uh, Skylab in 1973. Uh, he went on uh, to become the director of life sciences at the Johnson Space Center, I went on into industry and uh, is now uh, retired from industry, but he's still quite active and is on a board member of the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. So let me turn it over to you, Joe. Thank you, George. And uh, I'm going to shift to these other microphones in a minute, and I'm going to ask the rest of the uh, Skylab panel to come up and take your seats. Uh, and I would like to start by introducing uh, this uh, excellent panel. Uh, so Carolyn and Jerry and Mike. And Bob Parker, I didn't see you earlier this morning. Good to have you here. Uh, I'm... Uh, <laughs> Some of us haven't seen the rest of us in a long time, but I want to tell you I'm very excited and happy to be uh, a part of such a, an excellent panel with, uh, with the experience that we have. Skylab was launched 39 years ago, one week from today, May 25th, 1973. And uh, we're uh, privileged to have people uh, here in the panel who... Uh, not only witnessed that, but we're, we're a big part of it. Uh, let me start at the other end with, uh, with Bob Thompson. Uh, Bob, I think you were in the, uh, the military during World War II, but uh, started doing aeronautical research at Langley in 1947. Uh, and in 1959, when uh, we began to prepare for Mercury, uh, he was a NASA recovery team leader. Uh, uh, when, uh, when the uh, program moved to Houston, uh, he became chief of the Landing and Recovery Division at the Manned Spacecraft Center. And in 1966, Bob was named the uh, program manager for the uh, then uh, newly born Skylab program. Uh, he didn't stay with Skylab right through to the bitter end. Uh, they found something else they needed him to do, and in 1970, he became manager of the space shuttle program. <laughs> So uh, we have a guy who's uniquely qualified to talk about not only Skylab, but the transition between Skylab and, uh, and, uh, and shuttle and, and ISS. After, uh, after that, by the way, he had a distinguished career for many years at McDonnell Douglas. Uh, 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 set, second next to him uh, is uh, Dr. Carolyn Huntoon. Uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the one of the uh, principal investigators on Skylab, whom we have the honor of uh, of having with us today, she was a grad student at Baylor College of Medicine when the program got started. Uh, I think you got an NRC postdoc at the Manned Spacecraft Center. Uh, discovered uh, aldosterone uh, elevations in the uh, blood of or uh, urine of uh, Gemini astronauts, and uh, wrote that up and uh, and and was. Uh, Subsequently selected as a principal investigator on Skylab experiment M073, metabolic changes. I, we spent a lot of time pre-flight with, uh, with Carolyn, uh, uh, learning the importance of collecting our urine specimens very accurately. Uh, and uh, you might have been the youngest principal investigator on that program or in, in NASA at that time. Uh, her subsequent distinguished career included uh, uh, cooperation with the Russian program, uh, astronaut selection on a number of occasions and uh, the director at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, down next to me here is Jerry Carr. Uh, <clears throat> not just a dumb Marine, but he is a Marine with 8,000 hours of flight time. 
and a master's degree in aero engineering from Princeton University. Some of these Marines are pretty smart. In fact, I've, I've found that most of them are. Uh, Jerry was selected in 1966 as an astronaut with the, quote, original 19 uh, Apollo astronaut group and uh, was uh, uh, named commander of Skylab 4, the third, the 84-day flight of uh, Skylab. Uh, it was very rare. Of course, in the Mercury program, uh, everybody who flew was a rookie because nobody had ever flown in space before, but it became very unusual for a, uh, a rookie astronaut to be named commander of a mission, and, and that's what Jerry did. Uh, now I want to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to go to Craig Fisher uh, next to Jerry. Uh, Craig got his MD from the University of Kansas. Uh, he uh, took residency training in clinical pathology and nuclear medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, had a tour in the Army, flight surgeon training, uh, and was assigned to the Manned Spacecraft Center in 1964. By 1968, he was chief of the clinical laboratories, uh, managed the uh, crew area in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory for Project Apollo, and uh, subsequently managed the labs for, uh, for the Skylab program and was a co-investigator on the hematological effects ex uh, experiment, uh, another major Skylab experiment. So we have two investigators from Skylab with us. Uh, then we have Bob Parker, uh, Robert Rarp as we call him, Robert A.R. Parker, uh, next to the end. Uh, he's probably the, the, uh, the best example of a scientist astronaut in the program because he was a true astronaut and a true scientist. I was a fake scientist, just a flight surgeon. Uh, but Bob had, Bob had his PhD in astronomy from Caltech. Uh, he served as professor at the University of Wisconsin for four years in the mid-60s, then was selected as a scientist astronaut. Uh, he was a Capcom capsule communicator uh, for Apollo 15 and the final Apollo mission, Apollo 17, with his good friend Jack Schmidt and was then appointed program scientist for Skylab, or as he put it, the omniscient benevolent despot of scheduling multiple investigators and in multiple scientific disciplines, uh, all of whom were fighting for Skylab time and resources during that, that program. He, uh, he mentioned in his oral history that the, uh, the uh, anomaly that we uh, incurred on launch of Skylab, which upset the program, uh, schedule totally for the first flight actually made his job easier because the investigator said, oh, this is unexpected. We better do what Bob tells us. Uh, after Skylab, he flew twice on the shuttle, 1983 and 1990, and finished his career in senior management at JPL. Uh, Mike Gernhardt is with us. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we, had, uh, we have on the panel Mike Gernhardt and Mike Barrett, who were not involved in Skylab. They are much too young to have been involved in the, directly in, the, in, 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 in Skylab, but are, who are going to help us to take the Skylab findings and project them forward through their experience uh, on shuttle and space station and into the future. Mike was a deep sea diver, 1977 to 1985, 700-plus dives, joined Oceaneering International, uh, in 1984 and in 1987 or so, started Oceaneering Space Systems to provide NASA with EVA tools based on deep sea experience. He was selected astronaut in 1992, uh, has made four flights, uh, four spacewalks from both shuttle and the International Space Station, and has devised, and this to me is his crowning achievement, he may not consider it that, new denitrogenation procedures involving exercise, which I never thought would work, but it did work. <laughs> and it's been a, uh, not only a scientific advance, but a major increase in efficiency of space station EVAs. He now manages EVA products at JSE. I think that's true. I should have said projects. Uh, uh, our final uh, panel member is not here. It's Mike Barrett, uh, who got his MD at Northwestern in 1985. Uh, uh, residency is in internal and aerospace medicine, certified as a NASA uh, flight surgeon in 1992, astronaut in 2000, flew to the space station on Expedition 19-20, 199 days, two EVAs, uh, and then flew on the uh, STS-133, the next to last uh, shuttle flight in 2011. 
Uh, he co-authored a book, Principles of Clinical Medicine for Space Flight, which is a, a, a remarkable achievement. Uh, and he now manages the human research program at JSC. The reason he's not here is he, has to, he had to go this morning and meet with uh, Mike Sefredini, our ISS manager, uh, and his Russian counterpart, Alexei Krasnov, to negotiate sharing more crew and data on the, uh, on the International Space Station, uh, something which is dear to all our hearts, and I hope he succeeds. So uh, this is the panel, and I'd like to now call for a, a short video uh, on, on Skylab that we're going to show just to refresh the memories of those who were too young to remember <laughs> anything about Skylab. Uh, this video will emphasize the first Skylab mission, and while you're watching it, I want you to remember that most of the achievement for which Skylab's uh, is, is noted occurred on the second and third flights, not the first one. Okay. I'm Joe. Kerwin, I'm a, a Navy flight surgeon by trade who was uh, hired by NASA in 1965 to fly in space uh, and do medical things in space. And the mission was called Skylab. Skylab was our first space station. It was a prototype. It was designed to learn how to build space stations and repair them, uh, to learn how to, how to tend people for long, long durations in space, up to three months for Skylab, and what kind of support they needed, and to do real science in space. It was uh, early in 1966 uh, that uh, Kurt Michael and I were asked by Al Shepard to uh, head out to uh, California to look at the uh, inside of the fuel tank of the uh, uh, S-4B stage, as they called it, the third stage of the big uh, Saturn V uh, booster, uh, because the folks at, uh, at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville were interested in using it uh, as a prototype space station. Uh, emptying it out and refilling it with stuff and putting people in there. So it wasn't long before I found myself, along with several other astronauts, beginning to travel to Huntsville to help design this thing and ultimately to begin training on it. And we designed it and trained on it uh, uh, on and off for nearly seven years until 1973 when, when it flew. Uh, and it changed from an empty hydrogen fuel tank to a pretty wonderful prototype space station with uh, our own sleep compartments and our own bathroom, good medical experiments, uh, terrific solar physics uh, module with, uh, with the controls and displays there. So over these years, this thing turned from, a, uh, uh, from an idea into a very competent prototype space station. We called it the Von Braun Hilton. It was 1970 when Deke Slayton came into a, a pilot's meeting on a Monday morning and read off the names of 15 people. And he said, you guys are going to work Skylab from now on. Uh, and I was very glad to have my name on that list. And it was probably six or eight months after that that they formally announced the names of the crews. And that was a wonderful feeling. I mean, that's what we were here for. We were pretty relaxed going into uh, May 14th, 1973, uh, trained, ready, uh, ready to go. Uh, the, the, uh, the workshop launched a day before the crew on its very own Saturn V, and it would be up there and the solar panels deployed and everything ready for us to go up the next day and rendezvous and dock with it. Except that when it launched and went supersonic, the heat shield around this workshop came off. It pulled away in the wind stream. It took one of the two big solar panels with it, and it strapped the other one shut. Uh, it got into orbit okay, uh, but it began to heat up without the, uh, without the heat shield. Uh, the temperatures in here became 135 degrees. The food was starting to spoil. The batteries were, uh, were suffering. The mission was in serious trouble, and instead of launching the next day, uh, we went back to Houston with the whole engineering team from NASA and the contractors and spent 10, in retrospect, amazing and wonderful days designing how to fix Skylab. And boy, they did it. They did it in less than 10 days. So instead of launching on the 15th of May, we launched on the 25th of May. Uh, it took about eight hours for us to uh, uh, rendezvous with the, uh, with the Skylab. Pete was a, a, an excellent pilot, of course. and he. Uh, flew right up to it. We flew around it carefully while Paul in the right seat uh, handled the TV camera and sent pictures. 
and we described verbally what, what we saw, which was a, uh, a spacecraft with a lot of gold aluminum foil insulation that was already starting to look kind of blackened and burned by the sun. Uh, the uh, remnants of the, of the departed solar panel, just a bunch of wires and things uh, sticking up into space. And the good solar panel on the other side intact, but with this one, uh, one strap holding it down. We uh, went and docked, just partially docked. Uh, I won't go into the details of, uh, of the system, but we what they called soft docked, grabbed a sandwich for lunch, talked over the plan, uh, uh, with uh, with Houston, it was now about you know six in the evening, regular supper time. We decided to undock and go around and try and pull that solar panel up with a, uh, a sort of a shepherd's crook hook that we had to get under it, and we did. Uh, so that was our first spacewalk, essentially. Depressurize the spacecraft, open the side hatch. Whites goes uh, halfway out the hatch with the shepherd's crook. My job is to hold on to his leg so he doesn't go all the way out. <laughs> Uh, this is very unconventional. And he, tr he got the shepherd's crook under the solar panel and he gave a mighty heave and the command module rocked and even the workshop started to rock and its attitude jets began to fire and Conrad is working like heck to keep the two of them from banging into each other. Uh, it was a very exciting minute or two there, uh, but it was too strong. We couldn't break the strap. So uh, we uh, rendezvoused with the, uh, the, this uh, uh, hot, suffering Skylab, uh, and uh, went inside, uh, got in there, and on the, on the, uh, the very second day of the mission, we uh, uh, carefully went into the very hot Skylab workshop, this 130 degree workshop, and uh, uh, deployed a parasol, what we call the parasol, uh, out a, uh, an experiment hatch that was on the sunny side of the uh, of the uh, spacecraft, pushed this thing out 30 feet or so into space and then let the springs uh, open it up and then pulled it back alongside and it worked. The, the temperatures began to come down. Then we began activating the systems and doing whatever work we could while the backup crew on the ground worked in a big water tank at Marshall to try and, and uh, plan a spacewalk, an EVA, for us to go out and pry up that uh, solar panel. We had taken video uh, even in 1973, they had TV cameras, and we could uh, 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 radio that information down to, uh, to uh, Houston. So they had pictures of what was holding the solar panel shut, uh, and it boiled down to one scrap of aluminum from the heat shield. When the heat shield ripped off, a piece of aluminum had just riveted itself into the solar panel cover. So two weeks into the mission, we got ready, and we went outside, and. Uh, uh, we skinnied around to as close as we could get to the, to the uh, solar panel. The problem was that nobody had designed Skylab for maintenance or repair. The only reason we had suits at all was to go change film on the, uh, on the sun cameras. But we weren't going to the sun cameras. We were going down to this solar panel, and uh, there were no handholds, there were no footholds, there were no railways and no lights and no nothing. Uh, just a couple of struts to hang on to. Went down there tried to put that 25-foot pole with these little jaws at the end of it over the scrap of aluminum. Pretty soon, we stopped to rest. And Houston was frantic, because uh, we didn't have continuous coverage like they have nowadays in, in, in space. We had these uh, uh, ground stations at intervals around the world, and we'd get five minutes of conversation, and we'd be gone for half an hour. You know, uh, So we rested uh, there on the side of the, uh, of the workshop, by the time we were back in communication, we had the jaws on the aluminum scrap, we had pulled the right rope and had them halfway bitten through, and we were ready to, to do the rest of the job. Pete, hand over hand down this 25-foot pole, which was now a handrail, right? Uh, now I'm hanging out of the other end, with another rope, and he fastened a hook as far down on the solar panel cover as he could, and I tightened that rope up and tied it down to a stanchion. I cut the, the, the aluminum scrap by pulling the rest of the way on the jaws. Uh, and it popped up about another couple inches and then hung up, frozen, just like they thought. We got under this rope that we put, and we stood up on the, on the side of the, uh, of, the, of the workshop, just with our, the rope over our shoulders, just putting as much force as we could on that rope. And we stood up and we stood up and all of a sudden there was this popping and both of us went head over heels in space. <laughs>
connected by our umbilicals, of course. You know, we weren't really going to go, go anywhere. But we went to the end of our umbilicals. We pulled ourselves back down until we could grab hold of something and turned around. And there was the solar panel cover fully open. And the panels were starting to come out as the sun warmed them up. And it was one of the prettiest sights we had ever seen in our lives. We had won the battle. We were going to get our power back. We were going to finish the mission. The second and third missions were going to go, and the program was going to be a success. This is what we were thinking as we hung there looking at that, uh, at that solar panel come out. It was the first time in space that people had done repairs outside the vehicle. And it was an idea that just, it, it, I think it had seemed too dangerous before to send people out into a vacuum in suits. Uh, but uh, the idea was picked up, and you see it now not only in all the years of, uh, of shuttle operations where astronauts have gone out and done things in the cargo bay, where they've gone and replaced parts and uh, repaired the Hubble Space Telescope, and on the International Space Station where they're out all the time assembling, changing things around, repairing parts that have, uh, that have gone wrong. We, we sort of feel like the, the cowboys that did the first rudimentary trial of, uh, of that procedure. And uh, after that EVA, which I think was on day 14, and just sort of split our mission into two halves, uh, we settled down to get busy to uh, uh, be sure and complete our experiment objectives. One of them was to certify human beings for living and working in space for much longer periods of time than we had before, up to two months. And as it turned out, we went for three uh, with the third crew. Uh, and uh, so that involved doing the, uh, the uh, medical experiments and for the first time in the history of the program, doing rather complex experiments in orbit and not just before and after. Because we had the weight, we had the power, we had the volume, we had the priority. This was a medical mission. Skylab tends to get lost in the shadow of the wonderful Apollo program that preceded it. But we think that Skylab was successful uh, we know that, that people had always believed that you needed a house in space, you needed a way station, a refueling station, uh, an experiment station uh, on the way to outer destinations in the solar system. And uh, in order to do that, you had to learn how to build a space station properly uh, and learn how to, to maintain it and uh, how to reuse it and how to get to it and come back. and. Uh, uh, and learn how to build in the right countermeasures for the human beings so that they could survive and enjoy the, 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 the existence and keep their strength and endurance up and do the work for long periods of time. We're getting ready to send crews to Mars on missions that will take perhaps six months to get there, perhaps two or three years before they get back to Earth. And it's very important for these medical and, uh, uh, and physical countermeasures to be in place. Skylab started that. We started maintenance by uh, spacewalk. Uh, we, uh, we built the, uh, the design baseline for uh, space stations. Uh, we think we did a decent job. And, and the medical database in particular is still much better than anything that's ever been done since because we devoted so much time and effort to it. OK. Uh, Times have changed. I don't think they smoke cigars in mission control anymore. <laughs> but the rest of it's pretty good. Uh, that, that was not the important scientific part of, uh, of, uh, of Skylab, but, uh, but it was fun. Uh, and uh, now, now let's go into the, the details of, the, uh, of the, uh, the, the results. But I, I, I want the panel to start with the, uh, the historical context of Skylab. Uh, you know, at, at NASA's uh, uh, peak, uh, peak funding, which was 1966, and Skylab was, uh, was, was beginning already, as uh, Dr. Lane uh, referred to, there were a lot of changes in the United States. There was social upheaval. There was the Vietnam War and the objections to it. There were assassinations. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of things that took America's mind away from the Cold War and from NASA. And, uh, that had a, a, a dramatic effect on NASA's budget. But NASA had needed a, a post-Apollo plan, and uh, even by the mid-60s, they were planning 
for what the program was going to do to build on a successful moon landing program with numerous scientific lunar station missions. Uh, and all that got bugged by reality. And by 1970, only Skylab was, was left from the, uh, from the Apollo applications program. Uh, and the medical questions were not answered. Uh, with that preliminary, I'd like to uh, start with you, Bob, and, uh, and uh, let you talk about how, how you saw the problems and, uh, and prospects for Skylab. All right. Um, can you hear me all right? First of all, I thought when Joe started, he was going to tell you how old I am, but he did stop short of that. I appreciate that, Joe. Thank you very much. Um, when I start talking about space, I have to first of all establish two things. Number one, space to me is a whole lot of nothing. Now stop and think about that. We describe space as everything above 60 miles above the Earth. And when you think about that from the perspective of the universe, it's a whole lot of nothing. Now, we say nothing. There's a lot going on out in that nothing environment that maybe we don't even fully understand. But I think as we talk about space, one of the first things you have to do is talk about where in space and what is it you want to do when you get there. If you don't have that platform, you can't really talk very well. Secondly, and probably equally important, is you have to talk about money, cost, support. Now, I want to start, could I see that first slide? I want to start in 1966. And bear with me, I can't see the chart very well, but if you'll go to 1966 on that chart and cut off everything to the right, and don't look at that, that's where we were in 1966. And within NASA at that time, we had been through Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, we were at the peak right there, spending just under 5% of the total national budget on NASA. Now, that chart includes total NASA. The unmanned things, the manned things, the aeronautic things. But man was really, the manned things were really driving at that time. Today, the manned activity in NASA is roughly half of what NASA does, slightly under half. But back then, manned spaceflight was a big part of NASA, and we were sitting right at the peak of our curve at that time, and we had great plans. We could have gone on up to 7%, 10%. We could have probably gone to 15%. Uh, we had plans to go to Pluto, plans to go to Mars, plans to colonize the moon. Within NASA, and in industry to a certain degree, there's a time period where I call loose planning. You allow smart people to sit around and think about all the things they'd like to do. You don't give them a budget. You don't give them a time. You don't constrain them. Man, they can just cartoon everything. And then there comes a time when NASA has to get real, and they generally form program offices or project offices. And they pick a few people who maybe aren't too smart but try to sit around and understand things and make them program managers. <laughs> and they tie that program manager's hands with all kind of problems. You have to deal with young, female, good-looking people right out of college who come around and want to collect everything that goes in and out of a human being to figure out what went on. Uh, Carolyn, I apologize. You were very attractive, and I think we gave you everything you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now we're at 1966, and all of a sudden NASA wants to get programmatic about where to go post-Apollo. And there are all kinds of plans. We'd even contracted for an airlock by the McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Company, and the reason we contracted for an airlock out of the Gemini program is the Gemini door. Gemini had ejection seats, and it had a fairly large door in it that was space qualified. And hell, we thought if we could take that door and make an airlock out of it, 
We wouldn't have to dump the whole capsule when we wanted to go outside. We could go out through the airlock and the people could stay in the capsule pretty safely. So we'd already started post-Apollo back in the Gemini days. And McDonnell Douglas was pretty smart. They signed the contract with us for $10 million to build airlock. It ultimately grew into a multi-billion dollar Skylab program. But let me go through that time period a little bit. When it came time to do Apollo, and those of you in the audience that understand the rocket equation, understand staging, understand specific impulse, understand materials, and that sort of thing. And we engineers have terms that are almost as confusing as you doctors have. But I'm going to talk a little bit in engineering terms. When you look at the ISP that was available and the kind of chemical propulsion that was possible, looked at materials and everything. And if you're getting in the preliminary part of things, you optimize for weight, because you know that weight is money and cost program. The people at Langley, not even in the space business, did some optimization studies based on weight and determined that if you took a lunar orbit rendezvous approach to Apollo, you could sort of minimize weight and therefore minimize cost and maybe make a safer way of going about a program. Those of us in the space business here in Houston, or we weren't in Houston, I guess we were moving to Houston, and in Huntsville, we were looking at Earth orbit rendezvous or direct flying to the moon and landing on the moon, but after we stopped and thought, lunar orbit rendezvous is probably the right thing. Now, lunar orbit rendezvous, to go to the moon, you have seven throwaway propulsion stages. You go a little way, and you throw that one away. You go a little way, and you throw that one away. You throw a little way, and you throw that one away. And you minimize your coming back, because you'd like a minimum ballistic capsule that you can wrap tightly around three people if you want to send them out. It's still not too heavy to land by parachute. And you pick the ocean, because you don't want to manage the energy too much during entry. And hell, you can put the Navy out there and anywhere within a couple hundred miles is all right. So we, had, we knew how to do Apollo. And Apollo was moving along pretty well. And John Kennedy, who had started us on that path, had been assassinated, and Lyndon Johnson was a good, good job supporting the program. But he also had some other things he wanted to do. He had a great society. He had some international problems in Vietnam and things of that nature. So he called NASA in one day and said, turn the spending down. You're not going to keep going in that direction. Well, that threw sort of a monkey wrench in our thoughts. Pluto went out the window. We quit thinking about Pluto. And we started down, now you can move on over a little to the other side of that peak, and it's coming down pretty fast. But Apollo was on good steady course, had a lot of support. So we're trying to figure out where we're gonna go post-Apollo. There was a lot of debate then about space stations. People liked huge space stations. Werner was one of the really visionaries in space. The only problem with Werner, he wasn't a very good program man because he never worried about cost, he never worried about size, he never worried about the, some of the practical things of Newtonian physics sometimes. <laughs> but he made you think about all the great things you could do. Why would you want a great big rotating space station? and great big shuttles riding back and forth. Well, that'd be pretty nice. As Joe said, it would be the Von Braun Hilton. <laughs> but you got to be worried about cost. And are you smart enough to think of everything you want in a space station and build this great big monster and build a great big Nova class or bigger booster to shoot the thing up there? When you stop and get practical about it, Maybe you ought to go about space, about the way you would go about getting in business here on Earth. First thing you do is buy some land, hopefully big enough land to let you expand. Then you build a couple little buildings. Then as your businesses progress, you'd add a building or take away a building. So we came to the conclusion that 
even though those cartoons were beautiful, with those great big rotating space stations, in a program sense, maybe we ought to go to a modular space station. And then for the land, we would build a big truss structure. Then we'd hang the electrical power, the cooling system, the houses, the factories, the warehouses. And that's the way you should build a space station. And while we're in a space station, well, the costing's coming down. We've got to kind of stay near Earth orbit where it's cheaper. We'd like to go to Pluto, but the curve's coming down. <laughs> and what will a nation support? Because what that curve is there is what the nation will support. Not what we want to do, not what scientists want to do, not what engineers want to do. But when you get through debating in the Congress of the United States, that's what the country will support when it looks at all the other priorities in the country. I talk to some of my colleagues every now and then, and they say, gee, we want a robust space program. And I say, well, what is robust? Oh, it's, if you don't ask for it, you won't get it. And I said, well, but if you ask for it and don't get it and try to build it, you've had a folly. You don't have anything. <laughs> so it's a trade-off between asking for so much that you're going to just waste a bunch of money after four or five years, or you size something that you want. So we were coming down a ski slope trying to figure out what was practical for the country. But we also had to stop that peak growing. We had bought the number of Saturn V's that were going to be bought, shut off the Saturn V production. We had a bunch of S1Bs sitting around. And we had a hell of a debate that went on for about two years between the folks here in Houston and the folks at Marshall on how to build a transitional space station. I won't go through with that at all. I could spend hours on that, but we, went, we got through that. And we decided we would take the third stage of the Saturn V. Now, the Saturn V wasn't available when we started down that peak. But since we had, in the meantime, accomplished Apollo 8, it made a Saturn V available for Skylab. If Apollo 8 had not been the success it was, which moved the Apollo program well down towards success, we would have never been able to take a Saturn V out of the Apollo stream and do Skylab. It's just that simple. And had we tried to do Skylab with only the Saturn 1B and tried to build a wet workshop, I think we would have floundered, frankly. Maybe not, but it would have been a tough thing to do. Uh, Joe mentioned the Von Braun Hilton in the third stage of the um, Saturn V. The Von Braun Hilton is nice when you outfit it on the ground, but when you use it as a hydrogen tank before you try to outfit in space, you got a different set of problems. And that was with Skylab, and it was marginal to launch with the Saturn 1B. But anyway, that's another story. We had then figured out, number one, we wanted to go to a modular space station. Number two, we had the Saturn V available. Number three, within this country, the space station program coming out of Gemini was dropped by the Air Force who had that program going. It was called the MOL program. And MOL's cancellation cleared the way for Skylab to come to the surface. We shifted the name to Skylab from Apollo Applications, got that all locked up. And then we had to think about how do we get into the next program that you now know as the shuttle program. We didn't call it shuttle at that time, but the next program. Well, if you're going to build a modular space station, you have to have some kind of a vehicle to get the modules up there and put them together and assemble the space station, support the station, maintain the station. The modular space station needs drove the basic design of the space shuttle. I'm often told that the shuttle payload length of 65 feet was driven by a DOD requirement. That is not correct. The 65 feet came from the 40 foot long module we wanted for space station with room in front for an airlock and a docking interface. That added up to the 65 feet. That also turned out to be something that 
the Air Force was interested in, which was very good. They came in and supported us all the way on the program. But anyway, by the time we got down trying to get the country committed to space shuttle, the funding had come on down to about a 2% annual basis. And we had decided reusability would be a real benefit. Rather than throwing away seven propulsion stages, why not keep them all? So we were trying to conceive a two-stage, fully reusable shuttle vehicle. And it fit the bureaucracy quite well. It gave the folks at Marshall a big booster to build, gave us at JSC a big orbiter to build, and the bureaucracy was happy. The only problem is when we tried to sell that to the nation. Now by then, Richard Nixon is the president. Richard Nixon liked space, but not in the same vein that Lyndon Johnson did. He felt we ought to stay in the manned spaceflight business, but he didn't think we should spend anything like the four or five percent. And we kept searching for where we could stabilize coming down that steep curve. <coughs> Finally, President Nixon got tired of listening to his argue, and he said, and I'm going to be a little crude. He kind of said, I don't care what you build. I'd like to stay in the manned spaceflight business. You figure out how to do it at 1% or less of the federal budget. My view is its nation will support NASA at 1% or less. So we found a shuttle configuration that we could come down to 1%, stay at 1% or less, and the vehicle did everything the fully reusable vehicle did. All we had to do is put the liquid propellant in a throwaway tank, throw that away, move the orbiter propulsion system all the way down to the liftoff pad, brought the staging velocity all the way down to roughly 2,000 feet per second, pretty simple solid rocket boosters, get us what we wanted, and we had our program. And at 1970 now, by that time, I get called in the office one day and says, okay, you opened your big mouth, go do it. <laughs> so I had to leave Skylab and go to shuttle, and I won't talk about shuttle. I think you know what went on in the shuttle. So Joe, to me, Skylab it was the four-flight bridge program between the throwaway architecture of Apollo and the partially reusable architecture of shuttle. And I always describe the shuttle as an enabling system. It enabled us to go into where in space, into low Earth orbit, to do what there? Hubble is a good example. You could take propulsion stages there going up to GEO or going on somewhere else. You could go build a modular space station. You could support a modular space station. It was an enabling system, and we got 30 years of good flight use out of it. And that's sort of where we are today, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And <laughs> by the way, thanks for building the space show. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Are there any questions? Uh, Joe, you'll have to help me. My hearing is not quite 100%. Me too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> any questions for Mr. Thompson? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. And uh, kind of the next question is, uh, that's how we got to the configuration of, uh, of uh, Skylab. How did we get to the, uh, to the fact that life sciences was the, uh, the uh, top priority payload uh, to be examined on uh, Skylab? And uh, Carolyn, I'd like to hear you on uh, that count and whatever else you need to say about, about the planning stage. Well, I think uh, the discussion that you had in your film, Joe, sort of set the stage for this. With the um, early flights, as most of you know, the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, uh, we did not focus on life sciences, uh, to say the least. The uh, flight surgeons took care of the crew, and every once in a while there'd be an issue, and they would drag in a few scientists to talk about it, and we would get to uh, have our input, but it was certainly not uh, anything to do with life sciences. With the exception of Gemini 7, and I want to bring that up because I think it's sort of an unsung hero that doesn't get a lot of credit, but when we got ready to fly Gemini 7, um, it was a 14-day mission, two crew members, uh, and uh, Borman and Lovell, they just did a tremendous job. They measured 
Uh, the diet they took in was everything was accounted for. Uh, they collected every bit of the urine and every bit of the feces that they had. And they did this, and, and there were some other medical experiments too that were not near as invasive. Uh, and they did this on a continuing basis for 14 days. And the reason uh, was because it would take that long to get to the moon and back. And if we could find out these guys were okay at the end of 14 days, then we would be able to uh, continue with the Apollo program as planned. And they were and they did a tremendous job, and we got a good baseline data for 14 days. Um, and then it was like, okay guys, we did it now, so y'all back off, you life scientists back off, and we'll get to y'all again later. And indeed, later came with the Skylab mission. Uh, so when we began Skylab, the context was to take that information that we had gained from the post-flight observations on the Mercury and Gemini crews, uh, and, and the Apollo, take that information, and take the information that we gained on a, a Gemini 7, which was a, a tremendous gain. We also had some information from our Russian colleagues uh, on some of their duration missions, so we, had, we knew some of the changes they had seen, and we devised these experiments. And they, they did it as a subset of, uh, of anything you could imagine in medical science, we had an experiment that touched on some part of it. Um, I think the idea that we had 17 astronauts flew before Skylab and they all came back healthy, and I think that was one of our beginning uh, parts on uh, doing the Skylab missions. The other was um, trying to share these, uh, our enthusiasm for these experiments uh, with the crew uh, and with the managers, and uh, I have to say they, uh, once they said this was it, we were going to do Skylab, and medical was going to be a priority, then uh, we, had, we really had a, a good ride there for a while. Um, I think the integration of the experiments with each other, the medical experiments, and that today is still an issue. It was an issue with our Sky, uh, Skylab as well uh, then, and it is an issue now. Uh, if when more than one investigator wants to uh, study a crew member and they want them in a pristine situation, uh, that's a very difficult situation. And uh, we had to work on that, and we worked on that almost uh, daily. Uh, we also had to integrate with operations. That was a big issue. That was the context of integration with operations had never been done in a medical sense before. And I have to give my uh, colleague here, Robert Parker, credit for the tremendous job he did as a program scientist of making sure that every investigator got some of what they wanted, if not, if not everything. Uh, so, it, and that, that was not done and then set aside. That was done on a daily basis, and some days, long days, to integrate those experiments. So I think the, the big issue for the context of why we proposed what we did and how we were able to carry it out uh, was, was as everything had been in the human spaceflight program to date, uh, building on the previous missions, building on the previous knowledge, and we did that with, uh, with Skylab. You had the courage somehow to propose complete intake and output balance experiment on well, Skylab. Well, I didn't want, no, I didn't know if that should be an, uh, a context or an observation <laughs> 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 when we did that, but uh -huh. uh, we did, uh, for the first time, have this metabolic experiment in, in space, and Dr. Donald Whedon from the NIH, who's a very prestigious uh, investigator in calcium metabolism, came in. Uh, well, actually, we all proposed these experiments in context. They were sent to Washington, and then they got reviewed and reviewed and reviewed, and as things do, and they got approved. And Dr. Whedon came down to NASA to see us, and. Uh, Boy, he, what I had wanted and what other colleagues in their experiments had wanted was minor compared to what Dr. Whedon put down on the table. But he got it all. We did a complete metabolic balance. We had to do a food system. We had to do the urine collection and we had to collect the feces. Uh, they gave up on sweat after a while, but that wasn't too bad. So it was, it did, he did it, it was accomplished and uh, we were able to bring back to Earth all of these samples. And let me just say one more thing about the samples. We collected over a thousand samples uh, in space, and we came back and there were more than 5,000 analyses done on those samples on the Skylab mission. So you can just imagine the database that we established and is still being used today. 
Great. Joe, let me make an observation. Yeah. Uh, I, I touched on this earlier. I tried to describe a program from a program manager's view as opposed to a scientist or experimenter's point of view. And you sit over in the program manager's job, you don't know really what's going on over in the area that Carolyn worked. And I don't know what she just went through about negotiating within that group what she would settle for and what someone else would settle for. But they were always smart enough to send Carolyn to my change control board. <laughs> and I always thought it was her idea to do all of that. <laughs> and she got pretty well everything she came for. I didn't know, Carolyn, you were asking for more than you really wanted. You were a pretty no, no, good no, salesman. Not more than I wanted. <laughs> 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 Beautiful. She Dr. did an excellent job anyway, yeah. Joe. Dr. Parker, when, when, when did you get involved in this uh, business? I got involved in, at the end of Apollo 17. Apollo 17 finished in December of 72, and in January of 73, six months before launch, or five months before launch, uh -huh. or maybe four months, but anyway, um, that the, we found out because, of course, we were doing real, real space flight stuff in Apollo. But those of us who had been in Apollo found out that there had been simulations going on during the fall that the various people were unhappy about because every, all the scientists were at each other's throats and that the operational people at, were at each other's throats. And they needed somebody to straighten it out. And obviously, someone who had just had a nice, easy time on Apollo 17 <laughs> was the person to do it. <laughs> So that's, that's when I got involved, I mean, very much at the last moment. And when I got involved, frankly, um, I hadn't intended to mention that today, but there was a table that went from <coughs> life science all the way down to uh, probably one of the little corollary experiments yeah. with a priority uh -huh. assigned for each one along the way. And in theory, although we didn't have, hardly have computers in those days, a computer would have said, okay, these, this is the requirements, these people get this much, all based upon their priorities. And that just wasn't working out, apparently. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so we had to stop and put the sort of human judgment into that. And being an astronomer, I had obviously had the right <laughs> capability to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, but the other thing that, that really, as you, as you mentioned from my, my oral history, I never knew anybody read those oral histories, I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but, as, yeah, as it's, <laughs> but, but as Joe mentioned in, in, in from my oral history, the thing that really helped that replanning effort out was the total, almost total disaster at mm -hmm. launch because suddenly we were back at step zero and everything that everybody had been promised before was suddenly on the table and we could go off and try to make sense of it. Yeah, neat. Now they would take anything, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. And Craig, you were setting the labs up for the... Program. Well, actually, uh, I started 1964 and uh, uh, was the head of the, cl quote, clinical laboratories, which did, in those days, all of the blood, urine, and feces work. But the initial missions through uh, Gemini and Apollo were really data collection missions. We collected a relatively large database, but there was no real analysis. So our group, of which Carolyn and I and uh, someone who is not here, Steve Kimsey, uh, came up with uh, something revolutionary. It's called a, a scientific uh, analysis or hypothesis, revolutionary. And we then went out to the academic community and the industrial community and at every decision point in our um, analysis, we found an expert who had quite a reputation. And the reason uh, that that was not only good in a scientific sense, it was excellent in the defense of our project. It's a little hard to run over a Whedon. It's a little hard to run over a Swisher. It's a little hard to run over a Mengel or a Turgert. These are the scientists who we had recruited. So I had this outside group of, of uh, scientists with very, very good credentials and clout, and I was the inside guy. I was the one who went out to the carrier, drew the blood, and all the rest. The point is 
that we went from data collection to data analysis to then proving or disproving or modifying our hypotheses. And that is something that has, I think, uh, always, uh, as I look back, always been one of the major contributions of Skylab. By the time we got to Skylab, we were out of just the data collection mode. We were in specifically looking for things which would prove, disprove, or modify our hypothesis. We had a loss of red cell mass. We had shifts in plasma volume. We had uh, other uh, phenomena, some more subtle, and we now were looking at mechanism. So we went from data collection, and on Skylab we went to mechanism. And that was uh, a very important thing for people like uh, Mr. Thompson to give the managers and flight planners some level of comfort that we understood what was going on, it was not a limitation, and uh, it was uh, uh, a very satisfying era for, for those of us in the, in the biological science. So uh, I would say we went from data collection, data analysis, hypothesis, and then a flight that helped us prove or disprove and understand. That then gets translated in the managerial world in a level of comfort yeah. that they could go ahead with a long duration flight. Yeah. Super. Uh, before we go on into operations and results, <clears throat> I want to uh, quote a couple things from Dr. Chuck Berry. Uh, Chuck was asked to be on this panel, and he has a conflict with the Aerospace Medical Association meeting. <clears throat> he was kind enough to send me his comments on the, the battles he was fighting for life sciences uh, as the medical uh, director at JSC at that time. Uh, in June 1969, he said, biosatellite launched on a 30-day mission with Bonnie, a macaca monkey. That flight was aborted after eight days. This was a NASA launch, and it launched just a, a week or so before Apollo 11, as a matter of fact. Uh, and, uh, but it was aborted after eight days. The monkey was recovered and brought to Hawaii and died less than 24 hours after recovery. The uh, principal investigators testified before a congressional committee to stop, sty stop Skylab, uh, which was a problem for Chuck. Uh, in 1970, Soyuz 9, flew for 18 days and returned successfully. The crew was recovered, uh, recumbent, and took, according to Chuck, 20 to 25 days to regain their baseline values. Uh, and the same approximate uh, thing was true after our Apollo 15 flight. Uh, this just says to us, uh, we don't know everything we need to know about long duration flight. Maybe these longer durations are dangerous. Then in June 1971, Soyuz 11 returned after 24 days at Salyut, and the crew were found dead after recovery. Uh, there was some consternation, uh, and uh, negotiations with the USSR at the presidential level took place for data exchange between the two programs, and the Soviets were kind enough to uh, inform us that the problem was not a medical one. It was a, uh, it was a loss of pressure in the, uh, in the Soyuz uh, due to a faulty valve. Uh, and uh, so the NASA administrator then gave Skylab the go-ahead only with weekly extensions based on uh, a, a briefing to the administrator by the uh, senior life sciences person, uh, and he would give a, an okay to go for an extra week. That uh, especially applied to uh, your flight, Jerry, uh, which, you may, which you may recall. So with that as the, as the, uh, the context in the background of Skylab, Jerry, talk about about your experiences and, and what you think the, the, the good results were? Well, I'd uh, got quite a few subjects I'd like to talk about a little bit. Uh, th the one that was most important to us was productivity. Uh, we, uh, uh, we had a very, very crowded schedule. We had, uh, it was a very rigid schedule and there wasn't much opportunity within our schedule, uh, daily schedule for much uh, personal initiative. And, uh, uh, the crews on the shorter missions managed to cope with that pretty well, but when we got into the longer mission on uh, Skylab 4, um, we ran afoul of, uh, of several problems uh, with this fact that uh, the schedule was rigid and uh, there was little flexibility in it. We managed to uh, solve those kind of problems, 
And uh, we feel that uh, on the whole, uh, the whole Skylab program was quite productive. But I think all of us uh, would very freely admit that it wasn't productive enough. We could have been more productive had we done a better job of planning and scheduling what needed to go on. Um, we noticed also that, uh, or I noticed also, that uh, in the shuttle program and in the uh, uh, space lab program, uh, there were also some situations where crew and the mission control uh, got crosswise with each other because uh, of scheduling. And the crew began to, to feel somewhat oppressed in that they were being pushed faster uh, than they were willing to be pushed. And so therefore, uh, productivity starts to fall off. And uh, that not only is a, is a, a problem in terms of, of gathering the data, but it's a problem in terms of morale uh, of, the, uh, of the crew, because the crew's up there to do a job. They're up there to be successful, and they're not up there uh, to, to get into a situation where they start making mistakes. And uh, that plagued my particular crew. Uh, we managed to overcome it, and we ended up uh, very successful with our mission, but uh, we certainly did have a rocky time of it. I would be uh, uh, also remiss if I didn't talk about lessons learned. You know, lessons that uh, from the earlier missions, uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, uh, were lessons that we tried to pay attention to and, and, and factor into our design work and our scheduling on the, um, uh, on the Skylab. Um, very interesting point. Up until Skylab, the crew and the medical community, I would say were adversarial was their relationship. Whereas on Skylab, it became collegial. Uh, the crew was more than willing, with a few hiccups, of course. There were a couple of occasions where we did have problems in the planning phase between the, the astronaut group and, and the medical science group. But for all intents and purposes, I would say that uh, the relationship was very collegial, and I think that was excellent. And that's really what made uh, the, the life sciences experiments on Skylab as successful as they were. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I was at a, a meeting of the International, uh, the Association of Space Explorers. I met a young uh, cosmonaut named Manarov, who uh, pulled me aside one day and he said, I wanted to thank you very much for the work you accomplished, uh, the medical science work you accomplished on Skylab because it made my mission much more easily planned and much more easily uh, executed. Um, it's interesting that uh, some of the lessons that uh, have been learned on, on Skylab have had to be relearned. One notable exception is in the world of EVA and particularly in the way of, of, of EVA handholds. Um, you know, in the early days of the space station Freedom, uh, the contractor and NASA were very much disposed to avoid EVA at all costs. And uh, they ignored the fact that EVA on Skylab was very, very successful and that we were able to, to repair things and do things uh, even though we didn't even have a handrail system to get to it. And that lesson was learned very well on the International Shuttle and on the International Space Station. And uh, you have this wonderful EVA trail that the, uh, the shuttle uh, the station astronauts have got so that they can get where they need to go and work uh, easily and in a well-lit situation. And I think that that's a case where lessons were, were well learned. Um, there were some disappointments uh, to those of us who worked the, the Skylab program. Uh, and in particularly, the, uh, th there were cases where program management, where the astronaut office and where even the, the, the contractor management did not really care to hear anything about what worked on Skylab. And to those of us who were supporting the uh, space station design and uh, development, that was a big disappointment to us, that they really didn't feel uh, that Skylab was relevant to the International Space Station. And uh, uh, as I said before, the exception, of course, with the, the EVA situation. Uh, I think a lot of people had the attitude, don't confuse me with facts, I've got my mind made up, and it wasn't invented here, so I'm gonna do it right this time. And uh, so that was a disappointment for us in the lessons learned world, and I certainly hope that lessons learned uh, on the International Space Station in the, and in the shuttle world are going to be uh, properly noted, I'm sure they have been, 
And now your next problem is to get people to read them. The Skylab Lessons Learned, there was about 18 or 20 volumes of Skylab Lessons Learned. They call them experience bulletins. And um, I don't know how many times I would ask someone, have you read this experience bulletin about this particular subject that you're concerned about? And they would say, no, I don't even know what that is. So I think it's important that lessons learned get promulgated to the people who are working on the next program. And if you have to build them along the side with a two by four to make them read it, do it. Because so much time and energy is wasted when you don't benefit from somebody who's already been to a situation that's very much like that. Now, I'm particularly at, at this meeting, I'm eager to hear uh, quite a few things. Number one for me is uh, any new medical results. I've, I've seen a few things on the media and about new things that have been learned uh, uh, about uh, what happens to the human body in a weightless environment. And I'm eager to hear if we've uh, discovered any other things that are worrisome. And uh, uh, are there any new countermeasures besides just exercise as uh, the, the way to uh, stay in, in good shape and come back down in reasonably good shape? Uh, I'm a little worried about the stories about um, the visual problems that some of the astronauts and cosmonauts have been having. And uh, bone density, it sounds like the bone density situation may not have been totally understood yet. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear about that. I'd also like to hear about productivity and scheduling and whether or not uh, on the International Space Station uh, we have solved a lot of those productivity questions. Uh, are people more product productive now? Are they getting more time, uh, getting more work done when they're getting it done? Are they getting the right amount of leisure time and rest in order to be effective uh, experimenters? Uh, inventory management. We were always losing things on Skylab, but it, we would spend hours looking for something that someone had not properly stowed when they finished a job. And uh, I've heard stories about the International Space Station where you're having some problems with that. What are you gonna do about inventory management? Because people are people, and if you don't regiment them and make them uh, deal with inventory management, this, this will continue to plague us, and that feeds right back into productivity. When you have to look for three hours to find a piece of equipment that you have to have uh, in your hand at four o'clock in the afternoon to do a job, uh, you're in bad shape. The other question that, that uh, uh, I'd like to hear about, too, is cleanliness up there. Uh, as Skylab rolled on through the, uh, the, the months that uh, we were up there, uh, it was generally speaking very clean. And we had very, very few orders. Uh, once, once or twice something would get away from us and we would end up with an order. But uh, uh, some of the literature says that uh, at the end of Skylab, uh, there were notes uh, of, of food residue and dust, human skin, uh, uh, shed off the bodies and things like that didn't really make it to the air conditioning system where it could be picked up and normally cleaned. I wonder is that what's the space station like right now? Is it getting dirtier and dirtier or are we staying up with that? Uh, so that's, uh, that's another point like inventory control. Are we keeping up with inventory? Or are we keeping up with cleanliness inside this, this beautiful piece of equipment we have up there for which we have such high hopes? Thank you. Any questions? Uh, <clears throat> for me, <clears throat> you guys, <laughs> of course, went for 84 days, and, uh, and it hasn't been made clear to the audience that you were not planned to go for 84 days. The original plan was for two 56-day missions. The medical data from uh, Skylab 2 and 3 was encouraging, uh, and uh, it was decided and agreed to by Jerry that, uh, that their crew would go for three months uh, expanding the available diet with the use of inst carnation instant breakfast bars, for which they deserve a medal and never got one. Uh, but I'm, I'm I'm interested in 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 how you and your crew thought about the uh, uh, the exercise countermeasure, the diet, and in general your uh, your ability to. Uh, to come back uh, pretty strong and healthy after uh, three months. Yeah, we were very pleased uh, uh, about the condition uh, that we found ourselves in when we got back. We were religious about following the exercise uh, uh, protocols, and um, uh, again, because of the collegial uh, sort of uh, atmosphere between us and the people in medical sciences, we were eager to make sure that they got their data and got it pure. Uh, we screwed it up one time in the very beginning of the mission, 
uh, and uh, got caught and um, were chastised for it. But um, uh, generally speaking, we were very, very pleased to find that we could get back uh, and, and get back into a normal lifestyle uh, so soon after an 84-day mission. Uh, I'm told that it, it's not quite as easy as that is now when you're uh, going up for a six-month mission or a one-year mission, uh, and I would understand that. But uh, I was very, very surprised, and we were very pleased to find that we were in such good shape. In fact, we used to uh, tease the medical people and, and tell them that we were probably in better shape when we got back than when we left. You were the only one that didn't lose weight, as I recall. That's right. Al Shepard and I were the only ones in space who, have a, who gained weight or, or stayed even. Yeah, yeah. Carolyn, talk about results. Well, uh, uh, Jerry just reminded me of yeah. something that I, I wanted to say <coughs> early on. The um, challenge with the metabolic experiments and the, co and the collection of urine and blood and all, of course, was the equipment. Uh, a food system had to be developed uh, for Skylab that like nothing we've ever seen before because the investigator gave the food system experts, and uh, uh, a good friend of ours named Rita Rapp was the one that was the interface there, and I gave her a list of things, how much calcium a day, how much this a day, how much that a day, complete metabolic balance. And uh, then they were to go away and devise a food system that not only would meet the requirement, but would also uh, allow the uh, contractor who was preparing the food to package it and fix it so the crew could uh, prepare it every day and eat a certain amount. If they did not eat everything they were supposed to each day, they had to weigh what was left over. So I think early on they decided they would eat everything <laughs> to keep from having to <laughs> so weigh it. Right. How did they weigh it? Uh, Dr. Bill Thornton, a, a colleague of ours, an astronaut, uh, devised a, a mass measuring device uh, based on uh, oscillations uh, of the mass, and he, so the crew had to each time take anything they didn't eat uh, and do and uh, get the mass of it, as well as the fecal samples they collected every day. They had to weigh those before they were uh, evacuated. Uh, the water was taken out of them, and they were returned dry. So there was uh, quite a bit of effort going on there, and the food system was one that plagued us from the very beginning, and it worked out just fine. From our viewpoint, I'm not for sure it always worked out just fine from the crew. Uh, as Joe said, they had to supplement this uh, from 56 to 84 days. We had to send things along that were small and compact and all that because they still had to eat the same number of calories that they had eaten pre-flight. They had to drink the same amount of liquids. They had to collect all the urine and all. So it, it didn't matter that the mission was expanded twice, uh, times, uh, two times its duration was supposed to be, we still had to have the right amount of food on board and the right amount of nutrients. So that food system was a big issue. The urine collection device, never been done in space before, and there were many is issues about that. We finally devised a system, uh, had several people working on it, several contractors building them, testing them. And one of the things we found out, and now I'm going to regress in another moment here, to a thing called SMEAT, S-M-E-A-T, uh, Skylab Medical Experiment Altitude Test. Uh, those are unsung heroes there. Cripp and, and Bob Coe and Thornton went into that can for 56 days, and it was a ground-based simulation of Skylab. And, you know, there was rumors that they were doing it because we were all without stuff to do around the center, and they were putting us to work. Howsomever, those three guys were able to shake out some real problems that would have plagued us on Skylab, and they were able to get them fixed before we flew. The bicycle ergometer, which was a, not only an experiment device, it was also part of the crew's exercise capability. Bill Thornton managed to burn that thing up when no, in no period of time at all, which didn't surprise any of us that Bill could do that, but uh, by showing that it could not be used a lot uh, every day, uh, they had to go back and beef that up. The metabolic analyzer, which was one of the experiments to detect uh, the breathing out of the uh, carbon dioxide and how much oxygen and all was being taken in and all, it didn't work in there after a period of time. It was a good experiment device. It wasn't going to be good for operations. That had to be fixed. And the urine collection device had to be fixed. What we found out there <coughs> was that it had been proposed that each crew member would urinate no more than two liters a day. 
Uh, and uh, Bill Thornton thought that was ridiculous. And so he showed us and, and the engineers that he was going to urinate more than two liters a day and several other crew members did also on orbit. So we were able to pack on board some larger urine collection bags. If we had not, we would have lost a lot of our samples uh, for several of the crew members. So the SMEAT was a test. Uh, we found out some real problems. We found out some little things with, you know, uh, electrodes and things like that. But the big problems that had to be launched ready to go uh, we found out on SMEAT. So I think that was a, a big issue early on that maybe doesn't get enough credit uh, for what it did. Um, and speaking of the results, I, I said it before and I'll say it again, the, the crew members were instrumental in every phase of this experiment series we did. And we started the series three weeks before flight, conducted it throughout the flight, and for three weeks after flight. That became very important when we realized that we could not keep each crew member or all the crew members on the exact same nutrient intake and the same uh, uh, fluid intake and all because they were different body masses. They were, they were different individuals. They exercised differently. So we had to set up a pre-flight control and each crew member then was compared to his on control pre-flight. And that became very tedious because, of course, uh, starting three weeks before flight, the crew was not excited about starting their ex in-flight experiment to that, to that regime that they had to do, but they did it. And that was one of the other successful uh, things that we found out. We did confirm a lot of things that we had seen on Gemini. We confirmed the cardiovascular changes, and we also found out the, the exercise uh, changes that did that we had not been able to measure in flight were occurring in flight. We needed more exercise equipment that was sent up on the second and third flights uh, to do more than just the bicycle. We, we devised a treadmill and we also had some bungee kind of uh, weight things. So the crew, we profited on the second and third flights based on what we found out with the first flight. Uh, we had some issues on that first flight, as Joe said, because our experiments were supposed to start the minute they opened that uh, hatch and went in there. And with uh, Joe's crew, because they got all tied up with putting out parasols and everything, uh, they didn't collect, they didn't start their experiments. They tried and they did tell us what they had done. Uh, so uh, those, it was good that we had the baselines separate on the three crews because that way we could take into account those two weeks that uh, were not completely experiment uh, specific. Um, I'm, I want to mention this. We, for the first time, we flew a, a cap that had electrodes in it so that you could get sleep uh, measured on the scientist astronauts. The others, for some reason, didn't want their sleep measured, or maybe there weren't <laughs> enough caps for everybody. Uh, but that was the first time that had been done in space, and it was a, a very successful experiment. Uh, the vestibular people started their work there and uh, found out quite a few things and were able to um, come back and devise the experiments that really started answering questions more in the vestibular area uh, in the space lab uh, arena when they started their experiments. Um, the red cell people, uh, we had a whole team of folks working on the fact that we had seen the red cell mass change after Gemini and, and Apollo. And what we seem to find out is that the system decided they didn't, it didn't need red cells and shut down the production sort of early on uh, in, in flight. And that uh, more has come on that in the following missions. Uh, in our endocrine area, we found out the control of fluid and electrolytes uh, were endocrine control. And of course, we're very gravity dependent also. Um, and we were able to measure a lot of substances that had never been measured before and, and decided which ones were important. And they went into the preparation of experiments for space lab. I mentioned that in several areas, as well as the calcium area, because the experiments all grew. Uh, they, they, were, they were wonderful in, in Skylab. We collected more data than has ever been collected on a group of people in space. And we still use that data today. There is no other set of data like that. We had hoped that we would show our Russian colleagues this set of Skylab data, and they go, oh, OK, you've got 56 days. We'll go to 100 days. Uh-uh. They said, this is great. This is 56 days. We're ready to go. So we did, did not go to the elaborate 
collection system, and I can understand that. They probably couldn't get the cosmonauts to, to agree to what we got the astronauts to agree to do, but we did not, uh, we were not able to expand anything in the collection series beside, long, besides longer than the 84 days. That's probably enough, except now we're into six months and a year, and it'd be very, very nice on uh, the station to have a way to find out uh, about these losses in calcium and nitrogen and all, if those losses are still occurring, uh, at what level, or do they plateau uh, later on? And I know a lot of work is being done and has been done. Um, so I think the experiment part was tremendously successful. Why was it successful? We had a rehearsal. We had complete crew cooperation, and I think that's the number one thing for the experiments in space is to get a good crew and get good crew cooperation. We had good management support. We had a program scientist who was always over there every day pulling for the scientist, and uh, we integrated the experiments. We integrated them on the ground, we integrated them for SMEET, and we integrated them for Skylab. And I think that the program, the integration, particularly when you're measuring measurements on human beings and measurements interfere with each other, I mean, you don't want to draw your blood after someone's exercised, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have to have them integrated, and we were able to do that, and I think that is a lesson learned for station also, that uh, you have to be very careful which experiments you put on together, or if they're gonna be together, there has to be some time to make sure that uh, the work is being done uh, and doesn't interfere with the physiology. So I'll stop there. I Lots of pearls in there. Oh, go ahead, I might Jim. add that operationally, yeah. these, uh, uh, ex this, these experiments were pretty easy for us to do. We didn't really have a whole lot of trouble. Um, in the meta uh, metabolic area, we had uh, quite a variety of drinks to drink, and they had a category of food called empty calories so that you could, uh, uh, if you were still hungry after having eaten, you could uh, uh, have something extra. And, and for the most part, these were uh, butter cookies, I believe. And lemon drops. Yeah. And lemon drops. Is that That's how right. you kept your weight up? Pardon? Is that how you kept your weight up compared to the other guys? I, no, I really didn't do, do a lot of those, and the reason why was because when we got up there, the raspberry tang was all gone. <laughs> and uh, when we asked the people on the ground, Al Bean said, well, I have to admit, I drank it. <laughs> and they got, he dot ours too. And uh, uh, sugar cookies, or the uh, butter cookies and the lemon drops became legal tender on Skylab, <laughs> and um, <Lump> <laughs> uh, if you needed to have somebody do something for you or you wanted to pay somebody for something, you would pay off in, in uh, butter cookies. And uh, uh, luckily, we never got into a depression uh, uh, up there, uh, an economic depression for the lack of butter cookies. <laughs> Lots of good lessons learned, Carolyn. And the one I particularly wanted to echo was Smeet, the, the, that, that 56-day simulation was essential to the success of Skylab uh, in preparing the life support system, the waste management system, and the food system for flight. We would have had serious failures without, without that uh, and the subsequent work. Bob, Dr. Parker, tell us about the results and lessons learned in, uh, in experiment management and stuff like that. Well, the one, <laughs> the one, Amusing. I mean, a lot of these things are. Oh yeah, we all know that, right? Yeah. But the uh, one, the one amusing thing was that when we started out on, uh, on, uh, on working on well, uh, Skylab two, um, the first manned Skylab flight, um, the Jack Severe, my my assistant and I would, would and we sort of worked off uh, three three and four days a week, but we would work we would work we would go and, indi and individually work with the PIs. Or, or, the, or the different experiment groups. And we'd come back and we'd sit and we'd figure out what we could do or what we couldn't do. But we, the problem was we individually worked with them. That meant that all the, uh, solar, phys all, all the solar physicists thought that <coughs> theirs were the only experiments, <coughs> excuse me, being cut back. And all the, the biosciences thought that theirs was the only experiments being cut back, et cetera. It's, it's called open communication. And, Surprise, right? So that was the, the first thing that the two of us learned, um, and we learned it in spades uh, between the Space Lab, excuse me, Skylab 2 and Skylab 3. Mm -hmm. But so, so that was the one, one big thing in terms of working. What we did, because um, as, as, <coughs> as omniscient, as omniscient was the right word, right? Omniscient as we were, 
we could not distinguish between all the biomedical requirements. But we could rely upon the biomedical people to complain and work together and come up with a unifying position. Ditto with the Apollo uh, telescope people, ditto the Earth resources people, et cetera. And then we could take in these open meetings now and re work those against each other without having to get down into the real nitty gritty of the individual scientists. And that was, that was, it was a real difference for us and I think the p scientists on the ground um, between the first manned flight and the, s and the second and third ones. Made a, made a big difference on that. The, uh, one of the other things that was, was, is an amusing p difference between doing this in Skylab and doing it today is all these young, dark-haired people out there uh, can hardly believe the conditions that we worked under. Um, when we went in to draw up the, when we, when, when, we went, when I went in to look to see what the schedule was doing for the next day, I went into a room where there were people working on drawing boards with sharp pencils, with drawing tools, drawing out the individual, putting, you know, 20 minutes per here, 25 minutes per here, looking at a, looking at a set of tables, looking at a set of tables that said whether you could do this right after this, because those were many of the typical, and, and trying to do this all out. You know, two or three people working each night putting this together for actually two nights or two, two days away's work. I mean, by hand with pencils and drawing tools. I mean, yeah. none of this business is just going in, <laughs> which, we all, which all, all you younger people think is the only way you do that sort of stuff. It was just, just uh, unbelievable um, how, how much we did that. The, uh, but, and, and the other thing that we did do going up for particularly as we get up to Jerry's mission, when we said, yeah, we need to have some extra, equ not equipment, although well, we did take some of that, we need to have some extra materials on board, extra film to make, to do a very simple uh, idea, to have extra supplies on board to do extra experiments as the opportunity comes along. A, and a, and a particularly, just in 1973, it is amazing that in order to see the results for a comet that no one knew was coming, to see the results for Comet Kahutek, uh, after the past the sun, post perihelion, we actually delayed the launch of the mission by two weeks. So that the 84 days would give us good coverage. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, just amazing. We yeah. did that for the science. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, it's just amazing. Well, they told us it was the, the fins on the booster. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's right, they did. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, and, and finally, um, and finally, another thing which, um, again, all you dark-haired people have, have no, uh, or non, I guess I should say non-white-haired, there's some, some blondes out there. But anyway, but all you, you non-white-haired people would find absolutely amazing, and that is that, um, as Joe mentioned already, we only had sporadic communications with the crew yeah. and the uh, and with the on with coming of shuttle not until the shuttle carried up the Tedrises even space lab one I think only had one Tedris up but uh, but before that we had only sporadic communications um, and therefore we depended very much upon the crew's own initiative <laughs> and the uh, but but that just the, the idea of not having continuous I mean these days don't have continuous communication with the crew yeah well the crew probably re probably doesn't like that so much yeah, information transfer at those at, at that time was you, you like drinking through a fire hose whenever yeah, yeah. we had a 12 to 15 minute period of time when uh, <laughs> we could communicate we had to really move fast to communicate as much information as possible now now one now we did have one modern invention um, during Skylab uh, for the first time and that was a device called a teleprinter Mm -hmm. Where we could, uh, and there's a, there's actually I think a picture somewhere, maybe in, in the, these things here, did you have, which shows the reams of, of oh, information yeah. we sent. Well, we had one mission, six, one mission message that was 65 feet long. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but the, and, that, and that but that was the but but Skylab was the first mission that had a teleprinter on board. 
imagine that. Besides, before that, if you wanted a message up, you'd get a piece of paper and get a pencil and let us know when you're ready and then copy all this stuff down. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. those things make the communication and the replanning. And replanning is really where, it, where it's all about because you just can't sit down ahead of time and figure everything that's going to happen. I mean, apart, I mean, there are natural events like comets and, and weather and solar flares. Uh, there are anomalies like, like happen, and there are all sorts of things that come along. But the, the idea of, of doing the replanning, which was, as far as I was concerned, the whole mission. <laughs> it took a team and a team leader to make that all happen. <laughs> yeah, sure. And that's, to me, the, is, the, is the lesson learned that's right. from, from that aspect. Great. Anything uh, well, to add know, to I've, results? I've been, I've, I've been listening to uh, uh, several themes. Uh, number one is you need to have administrative support. And in days of yore, uh, it was a rather uh, thin layer of administration. Uh, from Gemini through Apollo, you had almost direct access to the decision makers. And there was no consensus management. It was a, a, a straight shot to the decision. And I, I think a lesson learned that I would suggest should be revisited is to, to put the experiments um, in a position where they are flexible and can get to the administration and make an end to the ops guys and make rapid decisions. Because right now, uh, we would never have been able to put together the Skylab uh, yeah. uh, protocols in the timeline that we had to do it. And to make the changes in near real time to, to gain the most uh, out of them. Second uh, theme was crew support. That, uh, that uh, changed so much between the early years and later years for two reasons. Number one, we never communicated early on to the crews directly, and that was a mistake. And I think <coughs> it was rectified uh, by Carolyn and her colleagues in Skylab because the crews have to implement it. I want to put one historical note in here. The first sleep study was done by Borman in, in mm. the... Gemini 7. He had a cap on, which he really did not like. Uh, but that was the first sleep study. But the point is, uh, the crews uh, now are included not only in uh, the implementation, but I think actually in part with the design. Yeah. And, and that, that's very, very important. Uh, and the last thing that I've heard is, I think, lost today is the necessity of doing a real simulation. Um, if anybody thinks they can jump off to Mars without a little extraterrestrial experience is uh, somebody who has no experience in a space program. Mm -hmm. And I think you've mentioned uh, several times uh, the necessity and the importance of a real simulation. And uh, that doesn't seem to be, uh, everything is uh, done on a computer with an algorithm. And that is fine as long as everything goes exactly as you planned, which it never does. So those are the three things I've heard that I just wanted to yeah. bring up and, and emphasize. Jerry, did, did anyone on your crew get to talk with a PI? Directly, um, I believe so. I believe uh, I right near the end of the to mission, Ed, Ed uh, Gibson yeah. was talking with some of the solar physicists. But, yeah, uh, that was yeah. very close to the end of the mission. That was that was the beginning of a breakthrough that was yeah. much needed. Um, okay, we and, have and a big part of that. Really, was when you got the Tedrises up, so you had continuous communication. So there was, you know, the the, the there was no huge, you know. Partly big, that, and partly protocol. Around yeah. communication. I always regretted that when we found in the vestibular system that we, that we were unable to become motion sick after eight or ten days acclimatization. You could spin as fast as uh, as the chair would spin, and you didn't get motion sick. We should have gone back to Dr. Graybeal and said, "Let's do it with our eyes open, uh, and and get another data point." But we didn't. We were too constrained or too unimaginative. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we happen to have one non-white-haired person sitting at the table who hasn't been heard from yet, Mike. Uh, 
and it, maybe it's time for you to to talk about what this program might have uh, spread forward that, uh, that was of interest or of use to you guys. Okay, great. Yeah, so I was gonna briefly discuss the trajectory of EVA or spacewalking from Skylab through shuttle, the International Space Station, and then on into the future, the, the work that I'm doing now. And I'll start by saying that Skylab has a really special place in my heart because when it was occurring, NASA and the Navy were doing the underwater living experiments, Tektite. And I was really into scuba diving at that time, uh, early in high school, and I started taking some physics courses. And, and that was the moment that I set the distant goal to be an astronaut. Uh, most people in my generation, it was Apollo 11. For me, it was Skylab and the underwater living experiments. The other thing I pick up on what Joe said, the, the 10 days they had to replan their mission after the uh, solar race didn't deploy, that, that's a great example of NASA at our best when we have a clear problem to solve and not that much time to solve that. And it, most of us in operations have had similar experiences to different degrees, and um, I'm leading one of the advanced exploration systems developments, and I'm trying to use that technique on a daily basis. And even though the agency maybe doesn't have clear focus right now, at, at smaller levels, we're trying to really uh, have, you know, maintain schedule, clear focus, and you know, that's a very important part. Um, <coughs> so going back to Skylab, you know, prior to Skylab, all the spacecraft had 100% oxygen from Mercury, Gemini, and, and Apollo. Uh, and so there was no risk of decompression sickness on spacewalks. Um, Skylab had a 70% oxygen, five pounds per square inch atmosphere, which really enabled spacewalks with essentially no DCS risk. Uh, as we moved into the shuttle, you know, surprise, now we're at 14.7 PSI and we really had a major problem with avoiding decompression sickness and, and getting the bends. And uh, the ground tests that were done leading up to the shuttle program resulted in 25% DCS, or 25% bends. And nobody liked that, but uh, the four-hour pre-breathe was as much as we could deal with with timelines. Uh, so that those procedures were actually approved for flight. Later, we implemented a 10.2 PSI staged procedure where we dropped the cabin pressure down. That resulted in essentially a 40-minute pre-breathe that was more practical. And so we did a lot of great spacewalks from space shuttle, everything from satellite servicing uh, to early station assembly. But then as we moved into the International Space Station, now we had this huge volume and depressing that to 10.2 PSI and repressing that was not an option. So our baseline was to go into the airlock and camp out overnight at 10.2 PSI after having done some pre-breathe. And then there was no bathroom or, or food or anything in the airlock. And so in the morning, we'd have to get up, put on an oxygen mask, equalize the pressure, excurt out of the airlock on a 120-foot long hose of oxygen, go use the head, grab some chow, get back in the, in the airlock, and then come off your mask and eat your breakfast and don your suit. So nobody liked that too well, plus it used a lot of oxygen and the, the timelines didn't work. And so uh, that's when I got engaged in the exercise pre-breathe program. And our goal was to, um, you know, to come up with a two-hour pre-breathe as opposed to the four-hour pre-breathe and, and have the same or, or similar risk than shuttle. But we actually did something a little bit different. Rather than just doing a bunch of tests and then asking a review committee, do you think that's acceptable? We actually spent a year to prospectively define what acceptable DCS risk was. And without beating that to death, we came up with um, decompression sickness risk of 15% or less at 95% confidence levels. And we picked that because at that level, there had never been a report of serious type 2 DCS. So we went off and did all these trials, and we ended up uh, developed. We did four different um, studies. And we came up with this two-hour exercise pre-breathe protocol where we did 10 minutes of exercise at 75% VO2 peak in a two-hour pre-breathe protocol. And the first time we did that, we still had 19% DCS. But then when we added 40 minutes of extremely light exercise associated with donning your liquid cooling garment and so forth, we dropped the DCS risk to zero, and we had almost no venous gas emboli. So something very interesting going on there scientifically that we're starting to investigate now. But yeah, so we developed that protocol. That was really instrumental in the assembly of the station because it allowed us to have the shuttle dock to station with the hatches open. So actually the first spacewalks we would do out of the shuttle, but later once we got the arm, uh, the SSRMS up to the space station, the, the <coughs> most recently trained arm operators came up on the shuttle and if we had that hatch closed, they wouldn't be able to be on the station side of the hatch. So it really enabled, uh, you know, 
also the logistics transfer for the shuttle uh, from the shuttle to the station while we're doing EVA. So that was that was a very instrumental and uh, in, in the success of, of the assembly of space station and just pointing that out one of the major accomplishments of of the space station was the demonstration you know with NASA and our international partners of the ability to use EVAs to assemble this extremely complex spacecraft and that kind of gets lost and hopefully this the good science will come out as, as we extend the laboratory but that that in itself is a tremendous human accomplishment um, now we're kind of in the mode where we're just doing spacewalks for maintenance it's looking fairly good uh, early on back in the early or late 80s we had this study called the Fisher Price study I think Bob probably remembers that but we're projecting these midlife crisis and and that could still happen so Do we've got that. EVAs yeah. hanging out there in front of us but then kind of fast forward in the last five years I've been working initially our lunar program and now the asteroid program um, so we had this thing that we called the wall of EVA as we're getting ready to, to build the space station. We're going to do more spacewalks in a short period of time than we had the previous 30-year history. And when you looked at our baseline lunar program, I don't have the chart here, but I, I had what I called the mountain of EVA. So it's this huge bunch of EVA, and it makes the wall of EVA look like, a, like an anthill. And so it was really clear to me that we needed to come up with a whole different concept of how to do EVAs. And without beating that to death, um, that basically drove the invention of a new class of spacecraft that we now call the Space Exploration Vehicle. And when we go to these exploration destinations, whether it be the moon, a near-Earth asteroid, moons of Mars and Mars, we need to have mobility to get around and, and, and do the observations and the scientific exploration. And so we need to combine that mobility with rapid EVA capability and rapid ingress capability in case we have a, a, a SPE event and so forth. So, so this vehicle is basically a very small vehicle that works as a system of two. So there's two crew in each of two vehicles. The um, atmosphere is eight pounds per square inch, 32% oxygen, which puts us in a much better posture for pre-breed. Then we've implemented this new design that we call a suit port. So instead of having suits in an airlock that is a pain in the tail to get out, and then you have to reclaim the gas, and it just, and like on station, on a good day, it takes us four and a half hours to get out of the door. And I've actually defined this thing I call the work efficiency index, which is the amount of time you spend getting ready to do the EVA versus the time that you're outside doing the EVA. And on space station, we are 0.36. So we spend about two and a half hours inside for every hour outside. And as a commercial diver, I was like, that, that's absurd. We need to do better than that. So anyhow, so instead of having an airlock, we have these suits hanging off the back of the vehicle where the suit itself is outside. There's a flange that interfaces to the suit port. And then we open a hatch and then we open the backpack of the suit, similar to the Russian Orlan suit, and we literally step into the suits, and then we close the suit backpack, and we close this hatch around it, and now we only have to depress this small vestibule between the bulkhead hatch and the suit port hatch. That's about 0.25 cubic feet versus, and I can do that as fast as I want to. And so, so we've actually built, um, we're on to our fourth generation of this vehicle that we've built, and, and Craig, to make you feel better, we actually go out and do very detailed sims you know, in the desert and underwater using this equipment. Uh, anyhow, and, and, and the bottom line is we are so much more effective. Our work efficiency index is closer to three, so it's a, it's, mm. you know, a tenfold increase. Uh, without getting into great detail, we did a whole lunar sim, and we had these geologists who could care less about anything but the rocks actually score our productivity in this space exploration vehicle versus an unpressurized rover. And the bottom line is we were 57% more productive with 61% less EVA time. And I can tell you the other thing is that maybe some people don't know is that the suits beat you up when you do EVAs. Doing three, you know, eight hour EVAs a week beats you up. I've lost my fingernails on every flight. I've had multiple shoulder surgeries. And that's when you do the long EVAs. With these suit ports and the, and the great windows we have in this vehicle, we can do many of the observations from inside, <coughs> plan our EVAs better, jump into suits and literally we're boots on the surface in about 11 minutes and you can pick up rocks for 40 minutes and then you come back inside and have your cup of coffee and lunch and it is so much better your fatigue level it, you know it's just I always say you know it's an honor to do an EVA but not a pleasure and <laughs> with this device it's an honor and a pleasure. So fast forward here, uh, the lunar program got canceled for the moment. We've been working asteroids, and it turns out that this vehicle made 
all the sense in the world for an asteroid. So we're actually using that with the reaction control jet sled instead of a mobility chassis. And at first I wasn't really big on asteroids for humans, um, but it's a real challenge. It's probably the toughest EVA thing we have because you've got uh, no handholds on that like space station. We've actually borrowed the, this boom idea that you guys use on Skylab and mm. we've invented this lightweight boom that we can walk around. Uh, we actually free fly this vehicle with an astronaut on an astronaut positioning system. But you're dealing, you've got all the dirt and the dust and, and the uncontrollability of, of a lunar environment without the gravity for ground reaction force. So it's a real challenge. Uh, we're doing a lot of work that makes me feel that, that we can do this. And, um, you know, I still have great confidence in the team at NASA and our international partners that, that we're going we're gonna to go ahead and, and do some things. We need to be more cost effective with the planning. We need to get this bureaucracy peeled back a bit. Um, in fact, quite a bit, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I have, I have, I am committed to making that happen. So that's all. Great, I've got. that's great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'd like to go once more down the line with uh, uh, final comments, lessons learned. Is uh, it possible for one panel member to ask another panel member a question? Uh, if it's there's a fine to be paid, but we'll work that out <laughs> afterwards. So go. I wanted to ask Mike. Um, if you go back, Mike, to the early days of Space Station, do you remember the EVA erectable truss approach? Yes, I do, very well. And my perspective of that is NASA management lost its nerve and gave up on the EVA erectable truss and went to a pre-integrated truss. That cost a lot of money. It slowed a program down that was in a high spending phase and change space station a fair amount. Also change the expandability of space station and the versatility of space station. <coughs> now the one thing it probably did on the positive side is we didn't know really how long some of those plastic tru trusses would have lasted. Right. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you could replace them would have been a reasonable answer to that. I think the message here is that running these kind of programs through long time periods with changes in management, management coming from different places with different backgrounds and motivation, particularly once a program gets in the high spending phase mm -hmm. and management loses its nerve <laughs> where you're going, backs up and starts somewhere else. If you'll recall, the reason NASA management lost its nerve, it appointed a two-man committee to look at the EVA and space station. And they concluded the EVA was too complex. I think they were exactly wrong. The EVA turned out to be more productive and more effective than e we were even projecting. And I, there's no question in my mind, but the EVA erectable truss could have worked quite well. So I have sort of mixed feelings on that. Um, at first, it sounded great, but then as we got into more details, it was like every strut was unique almost, so it wasn't quite as interchangeable as we thought. And then, even though we could have erected the truss EVA, and I agree with you with that, and it did give some flexibility, the pre-integration of the cables and all the other ORUs uh, would have been a lot of EVA work. And so, you know, having that pre-integrated on the ground and putting bigger pieces together, I think, worked pretty well. Well... We could argue this the rest of the morning, I think. For example, <laughs> the beauty of being able to go up there and run a piece of truss off in this direction and run a power line off to there and run a cooling line off Would to there. Would have given us a lot more flexibility. If, yeah. if we're going to become a spacefaring nation, yeah. we can't pre-integrate everything here on the ground and keep it in a, a hangar at Kennedy for two years while people play with it and then run any kind of a program. We kind of lost, lost our nerve, if you will, on what we thought of in shuttle, space station, a sub-element of space station at GEO, and then something back to L1 and something back to the moon, a spacefaring nation that builds on itself. Right. Uh, well, and those are good points, and, and also it and would allow basic, you to package the basic things architecture better. of how man is going to evolve in the space has not been thought through, in my judgment, very well. We have thought of it 
I want to go here and stand on that. Or I want to go there and do something. Well, and one of the things that my team is doing is we have the so-called hat team that looks at the forward transportation architectures. How do you get there? I want to go stand on that. We actually pick that up at the destination like we're the crew and the mission control team assigned to do the mission. And we get down into the nuts and bolts of the timelines and really try to understand that and assess the capabilities that we need and that we don't need so that we can inform better yeah. uh, hardware development. Somehow we need to get a slow, steady, evolving a man in space and keep management on that program through several presidents, several management groups, and <coughs> several things. This stopping and starting, and this way and that way. You just throw a lot of money of away. If we can figure out how to do on. that, we'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else have any final comments before we throw this open for questions? <coughs> Dr. Parker? Carolyn? Craig? Jerry? I think I, um, I, I resonated to Craig's uh, comment about uh, uh, the the direct access, uh, shortening up the the lines of communication between the people getting the job done and the people administrating it, and the people who can make the decisions. Uh, that's something that we enjoyed in the early days of the space program, and as the space program has gotten older and older, the lines have gotten longer and longer. And it'd be nice if we could find a way to uh, begin to shore those up, shorten them up a little bit. Okay, and my final comment is that I think the biggest the biggest lesson learned that might be applicable in the future is the way Skylab was brought together and managed as a, as a major expedition with well-focused goals. Uh, and life sciences was the, was the top of those goals. We, we, uh, we uh, stated our objectives, we developed a team, we trained and fought out the problems, and, uh, and we operated in, in, in flight with, with, with priorities, and it worked out beautifully. I would now like to open it up for comments and questions from the uh, from the floor. I can say that I <coughs> think that this panel is great, and it is great not just because we. Uh, acknowledge the new things. No, but we are become a witness to real great accomplishment. And uh, because when I was listening uh, to, the, and, uh, to this question, what was learned? It seemed to me who is working in, in space uh, life sciences for almost 35 years. It seems that everything was learned. That is unbelievable, but it is true. Because the first of all, that was the first experience of preparation and realization of the uh, project, which included from scratch everything, actually from scratch. Of course, you had already flight before. But that, is, that has nothing to do with uh, building the long-term space flight uh, stations. Because everything was, has to be invented, from organization to realization, from life to science. And it was done brilliantly. I can today, m more than 40 years later, oh, 40 years. 73, 13 today. Congratulate you again and again. Because uh, when I came to work in, um, in space medicine, uh, it was 78, 77, 78. And uh, the, uh, the, the data from Skylab was already known to us. And what is interesting, that actually these data were like the basic data because uh, there was excellent book, the, the results of Skylab, excellent. And I'm very sorry that you don't re-edit and re-edit it. I think it is necessary to do. I will tell you now why. Uh, now, the data from Skylab, uh, 
uh, consist a great part of what was written in uh, Russian American handbook in 75. Uh, and uh, look, it was only three flight of 28, 56, and 84 days. Only three flight. It's impossible to compare to those numbers of flight, long time flight, which we have today up to <coughs> 14 months duration. But in these three flights, there was obtained so much information on every system. Carolina told today very briefly, but even from your brief account, it, co it could be seen, you know? There was no area where, we, where you didn't try and or you didn't have results. And what is interesting, such an in interesting, yeah, you, uh, the, the people used the, mm, the, the methods which were already developed, but not only. The methods were specially developed to, uh, to get something in flight which, uh, which cannot be obtained without it. Like uh, up to now, up to, up to uh, um, our space station, we were ha not having the data about metabolic rate, you know, because the, um, the uh, uh, experiment with gas analysis were provided that time and never from that time on. Like we had excellent, outstanding uh, physiologist uh, who considered the same as Dr. Gazenko, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, our uh, founder of space medicine. I'm talking about uh, Genin, Abraham Genin. And Genin was respiratory and metabolic uh, man and he kept saying, that's, that's just a shame that up to now we don't have this gas analysis experiment on board besides Scarlett. And we had to, to uh, re uh, rely to on them when we had these questions. Now, on the vestibular, uh, the very first uh, 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 data on changing the vestibular responses in, in space uh, were obtained uh, in flight by Dr. Reshko, very young at the time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there was excellently uh, um, uh, uh, instrumented experiment which was specially designed for it, in which it was very cleverly shown that, that um, vestibular reaction in space are different from the, from the, uh, from, uh, the ground in flight, not pre-post flight, but in flight, and so on and so on. And I can continue because even uh, the other people know more about <coughs> organization. The organization was just new, right? Everything, including <coughs> rest uh, uh, and uh, work cycles and food and sleep and so on and so on. Uh, everything should be organized at that time. And work of three people together uh, Later, we were thinking about psychological compatibility, possibility to three, pe three, five, six people to work together. But they were working at that time beautifully. So what I am saying that that's great, but the only question which still, I think you didn't answer it. Such a brilliant project. How could it be, how could it be closed? From the end, on how could you desert this, you know? Program? <laughs> oh, oh, Skylab. <laughs> yes, Skylab. That's what I'm saying. Well, that's another story. You know, so <laughs> thank you very much for no. the compliments. Okay, no. I will ask, then I will ask, okay, the, the, we are sorry today. We think that was wrong. Is it, it, was somebody punished for it? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's no one I'm was after. punished. Because that's what I'm after. Yeah, I think they are, they are not only great, um, how to say, it is great disaster to, to, to your to development of your space shuttle. Space shuttle, I have nothing against it. I think it was a great program as well. Mm -hmm. But it is different program. 
the answer completely different question. Well, we have ISS now, Anessa. Let's go do three expeditions on ISS <laughs> and do them like we did Skylab. Let's do that. I think that we have to, uh, we, you know, we have to learn to learn more from our and your history. We have a lot which is not learned, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and therefore, my I think that's why we uh, have this panel to understand yeah. not only our successes, but our losses as well. Because sure. uh, I know that clever people say that people, nobody, uh, the people don't uh, learn from good things. People learn from <coughs> th these miscarriages. This is true, yeah, yeah. So okay, <coughs> any, any other questions? <laughs> My question is on uh, bone density loss. Uh, in the late uh, 1990s, we had the approval of the Fosmax class of drugs for uh, osteoblastic, uh, osteoclastic inhibition. And then uh, about four years ago, the approval of uh, the Rankle class for uh, osteoblastic <laughs> stimulation, which are doing a very good job in controlling osteoporosis in an aging population. Um, what, what has been done with regard to this issue of bone loss in testing the possibility of a, a pharmaceutical countermeasure for the uh, calcium loss. Did you have an answer to that question? Yeah, that's what I thought. If you'll give him the microphone, he can probably answer that better than, than uh, any of us up here. Well, I don't know. <coughs> Sorry, my name is Peter Norsk. I'm the element scientist for the human health and countermeasure element in the human research program. Uh, we just did a white paper on the state of the art of testing <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> bisphosphonates uh, uh, during flight. And, and Dr. Adrian LeBlanc is a PI for that particular experiment. It's been going on for many years. Uh, it, it's still in progress. Mm -hmm. And the state of the art is, is sound, it's, it looks very promising. Um, the, the, what we have now is an ARED, you know, the advanced uh, resistive exercise device in flight. And uh, another recent paper that came out from uh, Scott Smith's team indicates that ARED actually protects bone pretty well in terms of bone mineral density, uh, but we have a problem with biomarkers indicating that bone remodeling is still going on after six months of flight. So there's something going on in remodeling the bone from the tubercular bone to the cortical bone where we do not know yet uh, the consequence to the bone strength. So therefore, uh, the major issue now is to understand that. Uh, we do a lot of studies with bone strength measurements pre and post flight mm -hmm. uh, with finite element modeling and uh, uh, kind of uh, calculations of strength from finite element modeling and uh, QCT. And then uh, bisphosphonates, the state of the art is it looks promising. It looks like bisphosphonates actually counteracts this remodeling in combination with ARED. But the problem is the following. We still need the control experiment to the bisphosphonate in flight in terms of only looking into the effect of ARED on bone strength so, <coughs> that, we <coughs> so that we can distinguish uh, between the effects of bisphosphonate and ARED and see if bisphosphonate adds anything. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Since we have both uh, female and male astronauts and cosmonauts uh, these days, uh, the problem with bone loss uh, is related to your starting point of bone density as, uh, with regard to whether you have a pathologic effect on the bone loss. And so what you may decide for a male astronaut may be something different than you would decide for a female astronaut. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's playing out in the clinics for osteoporosis of the aging. Yeah, yeah. good point. Sir. Hi, uh, Alex Herbino from Baylor College of Medicine. I had a question and I think particularly focused for Dr. Gernhardt. And I was wondering, we heard from Skylab that there was this uh, initially an opposition and then a collaboration between the op side and the research side. And I was thinking with your background doing a lot of research before you joined the core and then on the operation side and being a crew member trying to implement that research. What are your lessons learned in trying to bring research into the operations and vice versa? And what is it that you found you can and you cannot do being in the EVA office that you could do uh, from the research side before? So that's a good question. And you know, I think it's essential to integrate the ops and the science from the outset. And 
in my case, since I had a foot in both worlds, I was able to do that. Um, some of these things are very arcane, okay? So some of the science is very arcane, and then the ops are arcane. So it takes a lot of communication to do that. Um, and I guess there's no magic formula other to, than to encourage integration of the ops with the science development from the beginning. For example, if there's promising countermeasures that look like they would be absolutely impossible to implement in space, then you know, maybe don't go down that path. So pick, pick ones that have the promise of being implementable you know, within the operational and budget constraints and, and focus on those. Um, also be prepared to throw some of these things out. You don't have to put all your eggs in one basket. If it doesn't work, you know, have fallback plans and things like that. But the short summary is better integration, earlier integration between operations and science. Uh, may I ask? Um, excuse me. Uh, uh, that's all speaking about the advantages, successes. Of course, it was a great victory. A lot of data gains still. Uh, uh, two questions about maybe something which could be a problem. And first, it's related to the mentioning of communication issue, which was due to limitation of the communication channel and short duration of communication sessions. The question is very Easy. Could you confirm and uh, just tell us in more details who took the initiative of the contact, mission control or the crew, and uh, how it was? Actually, the crew was addressing to the mission control during uh, certain periods, if all the time was used, all 30 minutes, or it was boring for the crew to talk for a long time. This is the first question. Second question, was it all smooth in the in relationship and as I said, that compatibility, interaction, effective. OK, uh, still there are anecdotes. Of course, I am too young to know what really happened. I joined this area of research a little bit sure. later. But uh, compatibility was fine. No problems inter-interaction between mission control and the crews. Uh, I am asking because it was, as for me as a psychologist, there were very special crews, not like crews before, crews consisting of scientists. And scientists are not that obedient, not that disciplined, maybe not that prone to bureaucracy like myself. Uh, and from that point, I expect to hear something more about that. I'm sorry for asking not very pleasant questions, but it's interesting for me. Well, I think, uh, and I don't know which one of the several of us <laughs> should answer that, but, which, but, but I think um, from the point of view of those of us who have worked in mission control and flown both, um, the, first, the first answer is either, either organization initiates a call if something needs to be called. I mean, it says, you know, Houston, it's, it's either Houston, Houston, Apollo, you know, Apollo or Apollo, Houston. Um, the, the second, but the second thing is that um, up until, and really that's almost beyond where I was in by STS-35, but up until, certainly up until Tidris, which is really shuttle, um, there were only two people, only two sets of people communicating. One, Capcoms, with rare exceptions, uh, who were all astronauts, and two, the crew, who were all astronauts. And so that was it. If the scientists had a question, that question, like it or not, and maybe sometimes scientists <laughs> may, have, um, may have bridled a little bit at it. I'd have to ask them. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but the, if the scientists had a question, that question came um, to mission control, uh, to a flight controller, to um, the flight director, then to the, uh, the Capcom to, to send it up. I mean, so it was always between, uh, and it was, and, and if you will, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, very, uh, very uh, filtered. Mm -hmm. But that, so I don't think, I think you're looking for a problem that uh, on a 99% scale wasn't a problem. I could, I might add something there, Joe. Uh, on Apollo 7, it's for the psychologist down here, on Apollo 7 we had 
little over 4% uh, air to ground coverage. Yeah, yeah. And uh, a lot of mission uh, objectives to accomplish. But even with that little uh, contact, there were times if we had a, like a 12 minute uh, contact between AOS and LOS, that we found that that did interfere sometimes with what we're doing. Because I can remember being working and it'll say, uh oh, damn, we gotta, we've got an AOS here coming up. So it has to be worked out uh, conveniently between it all because I can't imagine how you live when you got 100% air to ground. <laughs> <laughs> Just to expand on that with some recent work that we've done um, in an underwater exploration where we had these submarines were, I won't get into the great detail there, but we had a fiber optic cable and we had a science back room and we looked at real time comm and then NIA delayed comm, 50 seconds each way. And this is the first time that we actually in these submarines had this fiber optic cable where the scientists could look over our shoulders and we have these metrics and our science was better in the asteroid delayed comm, because with the real-time comm, the scientists were just firing off through the Capcom questions all the time. Uh, as, this, as the sub pilot, you're flying the sub with your feet, you're running the manipulator with your hand, and these scientists are asking to do this and do that. It's, it's like flying a, a, an ILS in bad weather and being asked to do a detailed geological survey on short final. So <laughs> once we switched over to the NEACOM, Everything slowed down. They were more thoughtful with respect to the request. The Capcom articulated it better. Uh, we would do these little tricky things that the ground would say, tag up when able. And then I would, if I wasn't busy, I'd say, okay, tag in five seconds. And then they would know I would talk. If I was busy, I would say tag in five minutes. And I'd start, start my watch. And they knew that I was going to talk in five minutes. So we avoided stepping on each other. So I think having a little bit of a filter between the scientist and the operator is not a bad thing. Is that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I would just say one thing from the scientist viewpoint. Uh, we did not have an opportunity to talk to the crew until Space Lab. And uh, at that time, I think the scientist, uh, the crew, I think, rotated through and decided they would talk to each investigator once or twice just to say, you know. So I get a call, and I'm sitting in my office, and I get this call from Owen Garriott. And I'm thinking, God, what's Owen calling me for? He's in space. <laughs> no idea. So, so, he, so he chatted with Carolyn. We're doing your experiment. Everything's going well. You got any problem? You know, it was that kind of a conversation. But it was sort of the opening of the door, uh, I believe, for the scientist astronauts to talk to the scientists <laughs> whose experiments they were doing. Uh, at that time, there were no issue. I guess if I had told him I wanted him to do something else differently or something, it would have been a problem. But I was still in such shock that he was calling me that I didn't say anything. But I think later on, I could see having a closer connection to the crew, uh, particularly if you're doing something in a tedious nature, uh, and I'll use a, a term maybe with cells or with a, uh, animal uh, surrogates or something, to uh, to have someone be able to say, oh, if that you know if that didn't do, do this or what have you, uh, unexpected issues. I think that would be a value. The, the other thing, just to hit on that, when we do these lunar sims out in the desert, we do have direct communication with the scientist in the morning and at night, and and that is invaluable because they can we can ask questions, they can say things philosophically about what we're doing well, what we're not doing well. So. Don't misunderstand that I don't think there should be any direct, con but during the real time ops, sometimes it's not that effective. Uh, one thing I'd like to interject, uh, having gone through Mercury and Gemini where most of the pilots were, uh, or astronauts rather, were uh, test pilots with no specific uh, scientific background, trying to survive uh, with new systems in a new environment. We've now graduated, really, where you're going to see much more autonomy on the part of the crew. The crews now are the scientists, for the, not, not in a small sense. And I think what you're going to see over time is mission control is going to be totally changed. And you're going to see the people on the space station, whatever it is, are, are going to be much more autonomous because they will be the experts. And that is a paradigm shift, I think, that uh, is taken place, started with Skylab, and has extended now to the point where uh, you have very qualified scientists 
as crew persons. So uh, you're going to see a lot less conflict because there isn't going to be much calm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take one more, otherwise we'll be late for lunch. Uh, thank you. Uh, even though I'm much too young to remember Skylab, I did want to. <laughs> the color of your hair. I did want to highlight uh, one thing that Dr. Huntoon and Dr. Fisher, and now Dr. Gernhardt has done, is that NASA has asked to have uh, medical equipment invented, uh, built, or um, renewed or enhanced, and this uh, equipment, of course, is being used for the general medical community in the U.S. and around the world. And so that's really pretty good and wonderful things that they have in instituted as well from NASA. Thanks very much, and thank all of you for listening, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll call it quits now.